jump into the, the, this message today, let me just kind of tell you what we're trying to do with this Newcomers Luncheon. We've had a lot of folks to come and become a part of our church, start attending our church in the last six months. And so if you've come in the last six months and you've become part of our church or just a regular attender, we really want to, to get to know you a little bit better. We want you to come. You can sign up right outside. We just need you to put your name down and how many you're coming so we know how much food to buy. It's absolutely free. Your kids can come. We just want to spend time with you, the staff and myself, Kathy and myself, just to get to know you. So be sure, if you've come in the last six months, to sign up today in the lobby. That's on September the 10th. Okay. Well, last week we started a brand new series called Kingdom. And if you missed that, it would be uh, really important and really good for you to go back and watch it online. You can always watch everything online at newlifecanton.com. Now, we covered a lot of information last week, a lot of information, and I made this point. I want to make it again. Information is good, but it's not life-changing. Theology is important. I love personally to study that. It's, 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 it's important, but theology will not change your family. What we're after in this series is, Lord, your kingdom Come. Your will be done on earth, in my life, in my family, at work, at home, at play, as it is in heaven. That's what we're after. The kingdom is about God's reign in my life. About making what's important to him important to me. To the point, listen that I actually change some things. That I actually change the way I live. Change the way I think. Change the way I plan. Change the way I parent. That's the present reality of the kingdom of God. It's right now. It's not just Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. I'm good when I have to die. That's not all there is to the kingdom. It's a right now reality, but it's also a future event. When Jesus comes back, folks, he's not coming back as the suffering servant. He's coming back as the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and he will set up a physical, literal kingdom on earth that will take place of all the governments and all the mess that we have right now. Is anybody ready for that? Come on, hallelujah. That's the future event. And then I ended with one word that I felt like would lay a foundation for our entire study. Does anybody remember what that one word was? Humility. Humility. And I used this illustration of the rope and the knot. And this could illustrate all kinds of things. It could be a partnership in a business. How many businesses have been lost because of, of issues and, and problems? And when one person's not willing to give or nobody's willing to give, it could represent definitely a marriage, friendship, maybe that parent-adult-child relationship. The, the, the thing was, is when we, we, we choose humility and choose the way of the kingdom, you, see, you know, if, if two people are unwilling to do that, they pull and pull and pull until this knot gets so tight in their life and their relationship that at some point it's so tight, nobody can undo it. And eventually it has to be severed. The point was, if we choose humility, we learn how to drop our side. Even if we know we're right, and we always are, right? Of course. But we choose to drop it in hopes of preserving and saving that relationship. Now, of course, when I got done preaching this, Kathy and I, we always talk and all this stuff, and she gives me an even better illustration about the rope. Of course she would, because <laughs> that's, that's, that's the way it goes. Actually, it's not, it's not necessarily better, but it's, it's a great addition, too, because here's the, here's the deal. Sometimes there are issues that you, you can't drop. 
There's, there are some times that there's some things that you can't drop in a healthy way. Dropping it would actually do more damage. So she said, another thing that you can do if that issue is, is, is such that you can't drop it is take a step towards that person. And what happens? That's powerful, isn't it? Give Kathy a hand. Woo! <laughs> That's humility. So I challenged you last week to try it. How did it go? Silence. <laughs> I hope that you did, and I hope that you saw the, 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 the power in the kingdom through that word humility and making it real. Folks, this series about the kingdom can be life-changing. It really can. I'm telling you, uh, I've been doing this for a while, and, and there's been few series and, and studies that have gotten to me like this, that have f- just fresh revelation. Rhema, a right now word. I'm telling you, it, it, it can be life-changing. It's all about how we receive it. Are you receptive today? Because these are not easy lessons. These are not easy talks. These are not easy sermons. We can quickly become offended. We can quickly receive it in the wrong spirit. And it can do damage. But if we receive it with the power In the presence of the Holy Spirit, it can be life-changing. And that brings us to the topic today, valuing the kingdom and receiving the gospel. Valuing the kingdom and receiving the gospel. So the sermon is sort of in two parts today, valuing and receiving. Say that with me. Valuing and receiving. One more time. Valuing and receiving. And really, I almost made this two sermons because it could be. But the more I prayed about it, the more I studied, the more I realized they were intrinsically connected. They are linked. And they needed to be taught together. Valuing and receiving. I don't think I've ever done this in a sermon, but I'm going to give you the big idea up front. It's kind of where we're going. And here it is. How much we value the kingdom determines how we receive the gospel. How much we value the kingdom of God determines how we receive the gospel. And we're going to tag on to that later at the end. There's another piece to that. Now, we can all find out very quickly what we value, can't we? We can just take a... I'm going to be mean here for just a little bit. We can take a quick peek, a little glance at that bank statement, that credit card statement. What would happen if you took your credit card statement or your bank statement, your online statement, and handed it to an auditor who was a stranger who did not know you? What would they come back with as to what you valued the most? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'll just dismiss you right now with that. No. Just think on that and go, no. Listen, I, I would never ask you to do something that I'm w- unwilling to do, so I actually was writing this, and I thought, you know what? I'll just go and pretend I'm an auditor of my bank statement. So I got online, began looking through all of those things, and if I was the auditor and I didn't know Alan... I would have to come to this conclusion. Look at the screen. Don't I'll get all holy up in here. Don't don't get all holy. What would be on the screen for you? What would be on the screen? What would the auditor say to you? Now, now my guy would, would, I mean, in my defense, my guy would see some good things, some kingdom things. I pay my tithes. I give in the offerings. I pay my bills. They would also see that I spend a bunch of money on my kids and their activities and tuition and sport. Can somebody say amen that feels what I'm talking about? Hallelujah. 
But basically, they would see a bunch of first world things. Stuff. Even though he would see some evidence of the kingdom, he would hand those papers back and most likely he would say, food. From what I can see, you value food. Oh, and Dunkin' Donuts coffee. Do you love Dunkin' Donuts coffee? Can I get a hallelujah? Now listen, listen, I can push, I can push back on that. I can push back on that all day long. Oh, but I'm a pastor. You don't understand. You have to understand in my heart, it's different. Look at the screen. The kingdom of God is about more than what's in our heart. It's also about what is in our hand. And evidently, what's in my hand is a cheeseburger. (laughs) And in the other hand is a Dunkin' Donuts large coffee. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) Come on. Listen, I'm being silly, but I'm not. What are you doing with what God puts in your hand? What value, there's our word, what value have you placed on what the king has given you? What value are you placing on the gospel? What value are you placing on your spiritual gifts and your calling? Not what you do to make a living on your calling. Pastor, I'm thankful in my heart. Well, I'm thankful in my heart too. We need to be thankful in our heart, but what's in our heart is not evidence to the world of the kingdom. The only evidence to the world that we're for real, the Bible calls fruit. Fruit. The tough question today, is there kingdom fruit being produced in my life? Is there kingdom fruit being produced? And we can push back on this all day long, but is there kingdom fruit? That's the bottom line. Now, as much as I want that auditor to come back and, and, and with my statements and, and immediately say, now, you obviously value the church and your faith the most. My want to doesn't always translate into reality. Is yours? It's not what you or I want to do that produces fruit. It's what we actually do with what he puts in our hand. So does everyone feel adequately condemned this morning? <laughs> hey, at least I'm not like most preachers where I just preach down my long nose and point out all I, I, I include myself. and in I'm an equal opportunity basher. Uh, transparent, that's right, brother. But seriously, wouldn't you agree that we need some help with this? Oh, my goodness. Am I the only one? Wouldn't you agree, if you're a believer here today, that we need some help with this? I've got some kingdom teachings here from Christ that I think are going to help us if we'll apply them, not just put them in our heart, but if we'll apply them. The first Half of this is about valuing the kingdom. And what what is the kingdom's value? What should it be? And then we're going to connect the dots later. But I want us to look at a parable, a short parable. And a parable is just a made-up story, an illustration used by the teacher that would connect the audience and get them in quickly. That's all it is. It's a made-up story to make a point. Matthew 13, 44 The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, it's the same thing, is like treasure. Hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Now, because it's short, I'm going to read it again. The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, then in his, what does it say? Joy went and sold all he had and bought the field. Very simple parable. If we try to read it, too much into it or discover the deep mysteries of the, we're going to mess it up. Right off the bat, Jesus lets us know that the kingdom is extremely valuable. 
But to make his point, he, he tells this, this parable of a guy walking through a, a, a field that doesn't even belong to him. He stubs his toe on some container or box, and he bends down and, and realizes it after further investigation that it's a treasure. It's extremely valuable. Now, to this, now this would, it's odd to us. This story is odd to us. When was the last time you walked through somebody else's property and found a treasure? Doesn't happen. You get shot, Right? This doesn't happen. You don't walk through somebody else's property. But in this day and time, they connected with this because there were no safety deposit boxes back then. And people did often bury their valuables. And then sometimes they wouldn't tell anybody about it, and they would pass away, they would die, and it would be forgotten. And so all of these folks, it's a, it didn't happen very often, but they could all relate that it could happen. For us, it'd be kind of like winning the but you don't do that anyway, so I, I know that. <laughs> Woo, glory. We won't jump into that one. But the big idea to this parable is not the treasure or the money or the good fortune. It's about what this person was willing to do to legally obtain this treasure by purchasing the entire field. Now, again, he did not purchase the treasure. He purchased the field. We cannot purchase the kingdom. We cannot buy our way into the kingdom. We cannot buy our salvation. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. But we can lay our lives down for the sake of the gospel. What was he willing to do? He sold all he had. The point is extremely simple. But the application is terrifying. Especially to us in first world America. Folks, this is a this teaching is a stumbling block to so many Christians. The idea that we would give up everything, lay everything down at the feet of the king, our lives, our hopes, our dreams, our jobs, our families, our children. That's crazy to think about. Nobody thinks like that. But if we truly understand the value, that's what we're talking about, the value of God's kingdom, which is living on a different level, a different level of joy, a different level of peace, a different level of hope, a different level of fulfillment, a different level of power and victory. If we truly understand the value of the kingdom, that is a happy trade. I'll understand why you didn't clap right there. <laughs> this is heavy. Don't miss the point here. Stop thinking about the stuff. That's what you're stumbling over. You're stumbling over the stuff. God is not saying you can't have a house you can't have a car or a decent job or take care of your family. Look at the screen. Jesus is not saying you can't have things, but he is saying that things should never have you. There can be only one ruler of your heart. You cannot, and Jesus did say this, you cannot serve God and money. You cannot pursue God, you cannot pursue the kingdom, you cannot pursue his righteousness and at the same time pursue the things of this world. It cannot happen, it will not happen. It, it, it's a recipe for disaster. So if there are certain things that are keeping you from experiencing the fullness of the kingdom of God, then we need to cut those things off. 
And I will not apologize for that strong statement because it's absolutely the truth. Because if we are valuing things and experiences and going after things of the world above the value of the kingdom, it's called idolatry. Okay, pastor, now we are thoroughly bleeding and beaten up and feel absolutely defeated. Thank you so much for this uplifting message. Aren't you glad you came? Hey, we're only halfway through. Was there a fight last night? Not much of one? You were up for 1.30. Come on, you can't pursue that. And go, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to, I'm just joking. Listen. All right, I want you to listen to me because I'm, this is important. This is not about condemnation. This is not about how far, far you're short. This is not about judgment. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. Otherwise, Jesus would not have had to come and be tortured and beaten and crucified on that cross. We have all, that's not what this is about. Don't miss the point. It's not about condemnation. On the contrary, it's about freedom. It's about freedom. Freedom from those things that we think are so important that we can't live without them. And yet they are robbing us from experiencing the fulfillment of the kingdom of God in our life. Let me show you what I mean in the second part of our message, which is about receiving the gospel. How we value the kingdom determines how we receive, remember? How we receive the gospel. So now let's talk about receiving the gospel. Matthew 13, we're going to talk about another parable, beginning with verse 1. Later that same day, Jesus left the house and, and sat beside the lake. A large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. Pause right there. This portion of, of Jesus' ministry, he was like a rock star. Thousands of people were coming and listening. You know, he would heal and he would teach and all of these. And people just, everybody wanted to get a piece of him. And so many people came in this instance that he had to go out in a boat to be able to, to teach all of them. But you know what? He began to teach these principles of the kingdom. And they were hard and they were difficult. And slowly, the people started falling away. This is hard. But it's real. Then he sat there and taught as the people stood on the shore. He told many stories in the form of parables such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered them across his field, some seeds fell on a put footpath and the birds came and ate them. Verse 5. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted up quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plants soon wilted under the hot sun and since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among thorns and grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. Now we're going to skip to verse 18, which is when Jesus gets alone with his disciples and tells them what it means. Verse 18. Now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. This week, I was doing something, and I began getting texts from, my, from Sarah, my middle daughter. She's a senior at Creekview, and she began texting me. And evidently, her and a friend, the door had opened for them to share the gospel with this unchurched, unsaved young man in one of their classes. And she's texting me questions like what to say next and He's asking questions, and she's under the table going, Ugh. and I'm trying to send it back and forth, and it was, it was great. But she, she said, Dad, my heart broke because no matter what we said to him, he would not receive any of it. The image that I got when she told me was that of, of taking some pebbles, some light pebbles, and throwing them across a frozen lake. That's the image that I got. Now, we've all met folks like that. Maybe you were like that. How many would say, that was me before I came to Christ? That my heart, my heart was hard, totally unreceptive. We've all met folks like that 
And the only answer, if God puts someone like that in your path, or maybe it's a loved one, a spouse, a son, a daughter, whatever, God has done that so that we will stand in the gap for them in prayer. Because prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit is the only thing that can break up that hard ground for them to be receptive of the gospel. How many have seen the movie Case for Christ, Lee Strobel, or read the book? He was an investigative journalist in the, in the early 80s. A devout atheist. Devout atheist. And then his wife got saved. <laughs> and that almost cost them their marriage. Because he thought it was absolutely ridiculous. A fairy tale. His heart, his heart was hard until she began to pray. And she began to pray the same prayer every single day. No matter what he did or how he made fun of her. And of course, he started his investigation to try to disprove Christianity. And of course, the, you know, the book, or the, I don't know the book, but the, the movie kind of made the point that it was that investigation that turned him. I'm telling you, it was her prayers to to break up that hard heart, and then in his investigation, God used that to him to receive the gospel. And he did, of course, get saved. I've seen it in my own family. My dad is going to watch this. Hey, Dad. <laughs> he always watches every week. And he supports this ministry now. But my dad wasn't always saved. My mom got saved in the 80s at Mount Perrin, Church of God. She got saved on fire, and we began to pray. And it was a long time, folks. It was a long time. It wasn't overnight. It wasn't a month. It wasn't a year. It was years. But now my dad's in church if nobody else is. He came to the Lord. God broke up that hard ground, and he's, he's one of those Thinkers like Lee Strobel, very philosophical, very, you know, da, 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 da. You know, it has to all make sense. God has to bring the faith, and that seed has to go down. And let me tell you something. I've seen it in my son's life. You, 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 I've talked about Chuck. You want to talk about somebody running hard from God in every possible way he could. Only a miracle of the Lord. Only people standing in the gap in prayer for him over and over and for years and years. And then he came to Christ. He, his, his heart was broken and he received the Lord. I'm telling you all of this to say, don't give up. If there's somebody in your life that you say there's no way they're ever going to come to Christ, their, their heart is just too hard, do not give up because there is power in your prayer and the Holy Spirit can come in and bring Break their heart so that they can receive the gospel and be changed forevermore. Forevermore. Verse 20. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. How many remember getting saved and receiving it with joy and everything just being so exciting? I mean, the, 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 the colors of the trees were greener. The, the sky was bluer. I mean, it was just, how many remember that? I mean, it was just absolute, you received it with joy. Verse 21, but since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. Now, some would say this is talking about losing their salvation. I'm not going to open that can of worms. There's really no need to this morning. I think it's more about the people who come to Christ. Listen to me. And at some point, they stop growing. They stop maturing. They plateau in their relationship with Christ, and then it's not long before they start going backwards. And then it's not long before they begin to lose their faith. Why? Because the storms of life are going to come. Jesus said, you will experience heartache. The storms of life come, 
And there's nothing there to sustain them because there's no roots, there's no foundation. And one of two things happens. Number one, they either they, they give up on Christianity altogether, they turn their back and they walk away. So sad, so tragic. Or number two, they stick around long enough to make us all miserable. Come on. No, I'm serious. Nothing makes them happy. There's always division, always chaos. They get mad at the pastor. They stop paying their tithes if they ever paid them before. They leave the church, and then they start church hopping. Oh, I'm preaching today, and y'all are just like, oh, you ain't, you know, whatever. I am. I'm, I'm preaching. But listen, I'm not, I'm not judging You may be here this morning and you are just angry. You're in this category. I'm glad you're here. Let me say it again. I'm glad you are here. Just behave yourself. (laughs) Everybody smile. Your face won't break. I've taught this before. Look at the screen. There are two sides of faith. There are two sides of faith, saving faith and keeping faith. And a better word, maybe is sustaining faith. Saving faith is only half of the gospel. Saving faith is only half of the kingdom. But that's where the majority of Christians live. And they wonder why there's never any victory. They wonder why there's never any freedom from sin. It's this right here. It's because you are only living and experiencing half of the gospel. It's a weak, anemic relationship with God, and it brings nothing but frustration, pain, and failure. You have saving faith, but no keeping faith, no sustaining faith. Saving faith is free, but sustaining and keeping faith is not There is a price, and that price is a daily walk, a daily commitment, a daily time with Christ to develop your relationship with him, a daily walk with him. Every single, a daily commitment, there is a price if you want to experience the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Does anybody agree with me today? Saving faith is free. We can only be saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, but sustaining faith is not. Verse 22. The seed that fell among the thorns represented those who hear God's word, but are all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, or maybe I should say the American dream, so no fruit, as our word, is produced. To me, this is talking about distractions. If I find myself in a season where I'm not producing fruit for the kingdom like I should, almost always it's about distractions. In the early 2000s, uh, I got into to flipping houses. I was full-time ministry. I got into flipping houses, started making some money. Then I got, bought rental property. <laughs> oh, Jesus, help us. Then I began to... Then I began, I got my my contractor's license, and I began to build houses from the ground up all along trying to do ministry. Now, don't misunderstand me. There's nothing wrong with making a living by being a builder or a contractor. That's not the point of this at all. It was a distraction to me. It was a distraction to me. And I think we all find ourselves in this category from time to time, don't we? Verse 23. The seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as God has planted. Real quickly about those numbers. I love that they're there because Jesus makes no differentiation about the number. You don't need to be comparing fruit with somebody else. Jesus called you to be you and to use your gifts to be you, not to compare what you're doing with somebody else. Come on. I can't compare what Stephen Furtick is doing in in Charlotte, you know, when he's got millions of people coming and all of this stuff. I have to be me. I have to, I'm I'm helping myself here because it's hard not to do that, all right? It's hard not to compare, isn't it? It's hard not to, but Jesus is saying by differentiating these numbers, it's not the number, it's the fact that you're producing fruit. 
Hallelujah. Now, each of these groups represented were receiving the gospel. They were all getting the same thing. They were all receiving the same seed, but they received it differently. Get this now. Don't, don't lose me. They received it differently based on the posture of their heart. The posture of their heart. Was their heart postured toward God or away when they received the gospel? This morning as I preach, the posture of your heart will determine how you receive this message. Is your heart postured toward God or what you have to do after church? Or tomorrow? Or the next day? Look at the screen. The posture of your heart determines how we will receive the gospel. The posture of our heart will determine how we receive the gospel. It's the difference between bearing fruit and coming up empty over and over. It's the difference between freedom and failure. The posture of our heart. So in the spirit of the coming season, anybody excited about a little football? Woo, it's all right. You can clap. I told the early service, if I had been preaching this in Alabama, the whole place would have caved in. And then, of course, we had a couple Alabama fans with their roll tide and all that. I want to throw the football at them. And that's all right. That's all right. It's all right. It's all right. It's okay. But I have a little, little pigskin illustration for you in the spirit of the coming season here. Jerry Rice was one of the greatest receivers of all time. Receivers, there's our word. This is going to be spiritual. Take a look at this. How good is he? He has done in two years what it took Charlie Joyner to do in seven years. 135 catches, 2,000 yards. Boy, did you notice how open he was? Oh, that's number 24. Yeah, Ray has one step and is jumping. Oh. Maybe not from a standing start, but most football plays start on the run. And they put him in motion. Look at that. What was the common theme of most of those catches? There's a, I mean, there could be a couple. But what's, what's the common theme? Touchdown, yeah, most of them were scores. But why were most of them scores? It's so the way he received it was what? Over the shoulder. He received most of those catches over the shoulder, his body was postured toward the goal when he caught the ball. Now that'll preach all day and twice on Sunday. Because it did. <laughs> it's all about, listen, it's all about his posture toward the goal. And on a perfect throw, oh my gosh, there's so many, anyway, on a perfect throw, he doesn't even have to break stride. Woo! He doesn't even have to slow down. He just catches that thing, and because his body is postured toward the goal, he can just keep right on going, and the chances of the enemy, the defense coming in and stopping him are very, very low. But if he has to stop and turn back and make the catch, the chances go up much more for him to be stopped. And that's the meaning of this parable. Listen, if we want to be successful in the kingdom of God, we've got to posture our whole lives towards God and towards the kingdom. We've got to posture our whole lives towards the goal because we have a quarterback who's never going to miss. Do you understand? He's going to put it right there every single time. And I don't know about you, that's what I want. I'm going to catch my over-the-shoulder catch, and I'm going to keep my body postured toward the kingdom of God. But to do that, if we posture our life towards the kingdom, we're going to have to turn our back on some other things. Feel the Holy Spirit. If you decide that you're going to posture your life towards the kingdom, then you're going to have to turn your back 
on some other things, and they're not necessarily evil, sinful things, but they distract from the goal. You, it's, it's basically you having to stop and turn to make the catch, and then guess it's not long before the enemy comes and takes you out. Look at the screen. How we receive the gospel determines our success in the kingdom. How we receive the gospel determines our success bearing fruit in the kingdom. Pastor, how do we do that? How do we posture posture our hearts towards God? How do we properly receive so we can be successful? The answer is clear in Hebrews 12. Verse 1, therefore, now just pause right there because anytime there's a therefore, you got to find out what it's there for. And it's there for the previous chapter is Hebrews 11, which, what's that? The faith chapter. And if you read all of Hebrews 11, you know that both sides of faith are present. Saving faith, victorious faith and sustaining faith. What are you talking about, Pastor? Well, the first half of Hebrews 11 is all about the power of faith and the victory of faith and all these amazing feats of faith. And then the second half is about people and martyrs getting cut in half for the gospel. That's not as fun. The second half of Hebrews 11 talks about when the ax is not stayed, but it goes down. What happens then to your faith? The second half of Hebrews 11 talks about when the miracle doesn't come like we think it should. What happens to your faith? If you only have a saving faith and you're only living on half the gospel, then you've got problems. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to this life of faith, the full faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Now, here's the answer. Verse 2, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects. There's our saving faith and our sustaining faith. He's saying the answer is to posture your whole life. Everything you do and everything that you're about, posturing it towards the goal line, posturing it towards the kingdom, and turning your back on those things that would hold you back and keep you down and take you out. I'm skipping that next slide. Folks, listen to me. That's the price we must pay. And that goes back to what we talked about in the beginning, the value of the kingdom. If we're not valuing the kingdom, we will not posture our life towards it. If we're not valuing the kingdom, we won't turn our back on those things. But if we do that, we will not bear fruit and we will not live a victorious life life of faith. I'm ending with this because this has been a tough word and I've, 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 I've thrown some punches. But you know what's cool about the word? It cuts and it goes deeper. Uh, Hebrew says it goes deeper than a double-edged sword. But you know what it also does? It heals. Yeah. It brings healing. It brings healing. Come on, somebody. It brings healing. So when God cuts us deep with his word, with his rhema, prophetic word, he will come in behind it if we will let him, and he will heal us with the same word. And here's what I'm telling you today. You can do this. 
you can do this by the power of the Holy Spirit and by walking in the Spirit. You can do this because he said he would never leave you or forsake you. No matter how many times you get tackled, no matter how many times you, you stumble or fall, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Come on, he will forgive you. And I'm telling you, you just need to get back up. You can posture your life again to the kingdom of God over and over. Receive the gospel. Receive the gospel. Receive the gospel. Stand with me.